Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 6th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the big lie the top 20% keeps spreading about the impact of various fiscal options on Alaska families and the economy. Second, we explain what we believe the governor could do in handling the FY24 budget that would help protect the PFD and restore some balance to the fiscal discussion. And third, we explain how Hillcorp is receiving a $100 million tax bonus on top of the SB21 incentives and why we believe that is bad policy. And now, let's join Michael. Weekly top three, the big one for today, of course, is the big top 20% lie. That's where we're going to start the whole conversation this morning. You say they've got the they got the hashtag, in fact, hashtag big lie from the top 20%. Uh, hit me with it. What do, we, uh, what do we got going on here? Well, usually at the end of the session, we get an uh, op-ed from somebody in the top 20% praising the legislature for yet again fiscal responsibility. Uh, in their opinion. <clears throat> the last few years, it's been Carl Mars. Uh, before that, it was uh, uh, Jim Jensen on occasionally. This year, Harry McDonald evidently drew the short straw, and Harry McDonald ha has written the obligatory, uh, seemingly obligatory uh, uh, op-ed uh, that's appeared in Anchorage, Must Read, uh, Fairbanks, Juno, uh, all over the place. Uh, the headline of it is, Legislature Deserves Credit for fiscal responsibility. And while they've done it before, uh, because uh, Governor Dunleavy had, has talked about a sales tax, this year it sort of stood out to me. These op-eds always have a big lie, well, at least one big lie in them. And, and, and this year, the one by Harry McDonald, the big lie in Harry McDonald just popped out at me. It says, implementing a statewide sales tax would hurt everyone most particularly low-income and rural Alaskans, it would be a significant drag to the state's recovering economy. That's Harry's, uh, Harry's counter to <laughs> the argument that we ought to be using, uh, uh, that we ought to be substituting, substituting sales taxes for PFD cuts Wow! Uh, if we need them. Now, here's, <laughs> it's not <laughs> like, it's not like, you know, this is even an arguable issue. In, in 2017, both the 2016 and the 2017 ICER and ITEP uh, uh, studies took this head on, took the issue head on. And here's what uh, ICER said uh, in a subsequent 2017 follow-up to its 2016 study. A cut in PFDs would be by far the costliest measure for Alaska families. Households with children would pay about 2.5 times more per person than those without children for every $100 million of revenue raised. Sales taxes, this is Harry's, you know, big Oh my God, we miss sales taxes, according to Harry. Sales taxes would be the next costliest for households, with for Alaska households. Again, those households tend to have lower income. Sales taxes are the same for everyone, so they take a bigger share of income from poorer households. But the, but the key point is a cut in PFDs would be by far, by far, I'm quoting, the costliest measure for Alaska families. Sales taxes though regressive, would have, uh, would have a secondary impact. 
So you go back to Harry's, you go back to Harry's op-ed, implementing a state, state, statewide sales tax would hurt everyone, most particularly low income and rural Alaskans and would be a significant drag. You know what would be worse, Harry? <laughs> PFD cuts. PFD cuts would be worse, are worse. I love how they found a religion all of a sudden. Oh, we would hurt the poor. We would hurt the poor and the and, and the villagers and the indigent. What do you think you just did? I mean, by cutting, you know, three quarters of the PFD out. What do you think you just did? Yeah, it's a, uh, it, it, it's a, I mean, it's the, it's the big lie, right? If you repeat it often enough, if you repeat often enough that sales taxes are bad, sales taxes hurt poor. You repeat that often enough, and, and evidently in enough newspapers and enough news outlets, if you hit Juno and Fairbanks and, and oh, I forgot Matsu, they hit Matsu, the frontiersman also, probably hit the, the, the Kenai Peninsula also. Um, if you repeat it, if you repeat it often enough in enough newspapers, it must be true, but it's not true. It's the big lie. The big lie that, that the top 20% are trying to spread is that taxes would be bad. They'd be horrible. They would Im impact low-income Alaska families. They would take money out of the Alaska economy. And they are bad, except for the thing that's worse by far, PFD cuts. So it's just, I mean, what we've got is a situation where the top 20% are just trying to cover their tracks wherever they can. And now, and, and, and they've done it before, but now they're just resorting to lying about the, the relative impacts of PFD cuts versus sales taxes uh, on Alaska families. And it's, you know, it's sort of disgusting. I, I, it, it's, it's, let's have a debate. Let's have a debate about whether PFD cuts or sales taxes or income taxes or flat taxes are the white, right way to cover this, are the white, right way to cover this deficit. Because we now know from, you know, this, the show uh, over the course of the, over the course of the post-session interviews that you've done. We now know that there's no will to cut spending. So let's talk about whether PFD cuts, let's talk fairly about whether PFD cuts, sales taxes, income taxes, flat taxes, or the or oil taxes are the right way uh, to cover the deficit. But let's not lie about it. Let's not, let's not, let's not, you know, spread the big lie that sales taxes are the, are horrible. They're bad for low income and, 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 and Alaska families, and they're bad for the economy. There is something worse, and the thing we are using is that something. PFD cuts have by far the, a larger adverse impact on Alaska families, on low-income, middle-income Alaska families, uh, and on the overall Alaska economy than sales taxes. So let's at least let's at least have the debate on the facts. Let's stop lying, Harry, and, well, uh, and be honest about it. We've talked about this on the program before, Brad. I'm not a fan of taxes, right? I mean, you know, you and I have talked about this for years, but I've always said. If, you know, if we can stand in the middle of the road with our hand out saying, stop, you guys need to cut and the train will just roll on and roll right over us if we're not paying attention. Right. Because there, I, there is no political will to cut. We want it to happen, but we are apparently a, 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 a minority in this state. We are a true minority in this state of people who actually want to cut the size and scope of government. Shocking. We thought we were in the majority. Turns out, no, we're not. What, 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 what did McCabe, what did McCabe say? The only people who want to cut spending are the, are the ones that listen to this show. Uh, that's They're, kind of, that's kind of what he said. Right. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I thought we were talking to a lot more Alaskans. I thought there were more people out there that felt the same way. And in one side of their mouth, they may, but on the other side, they're like, yeah, but don't cut the program in my backyard. You know what I mean? So they want to cut, but they're not really mm, fully on board with cuts. So the bottom line is, if there's going to be a discussion on taxes, and let's face it, here's what I would like to see. Carl, Carl Mars and Donald and all these folks that are writing these op-eds, I'm going to be interested to see in about three or four years when taxes are inevitable, what their op-eds are going to look like. Because they are coming. Once the PFD has gone and the size and scope of government continues to grow because it will, it's baked in. I'm interested to see what their op-eds look like then. But the bottom line is if we're going to face taxes, we should have an honest discussion about what is the best tax structure that does the least amount of damage to the private economy. But since they don't care about the private economy, as we pointed out time and time again, and they're divorced from the private economy, they really don't care. They want the one that's most expedient. Michael, they care about the private economy. They care about their private economy. The top 20% are looking out 
for their share of the private economy, their bank accounts and, and, and their businesses that are tied to state spending. They care about, they care about the private economy. They want to make sure that other segments of the private economy, the middle and lower income Alaska family segments of the private economy are the ones paying for it. I mean, it's not, it's not that they don't care. They care very much. <laughs> they care about their own bank accounts and they, and they want to protect their own bank accounts by shoving the dollars, by shoving the responsibility down to middle and lower income Alaska. Right. Families. Two years, three years from now, what's the debate going to be? Then Harry's going to be in favor of sales taxes. You know why? Because sales taxes are the next most regressive <laughs> approach right. to raising right. revenues. And so they're going to want to shove it down. That they'll they'll have to pay a little bit, but the bulk of it will be shoved down to middle and lower income Alaska families. So right. it's it, it, they are. Let's be clear. They're looking out for their share of the private economy. Let's also be clear. The middle and lower income Alaska families aren't doing a very good job of looking out for their share of the private economy. We're, you know, belly aching about government spending. And as you say, we've been rolled over by the bus and, you know, and, and, and we're the ones middle and lower income Alaska families are the ones paying for it. So it's, uh, it's, we, we've seen where this, we've seen how this movie's playing out. And, and we've seen the continuation of the movie session after session after session. Harry, and, and now we're now we're just seeing, you know, people lying to keep it going. Harry and, and Mars and Jensen, all of them just lying their, you know, their 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 fannies off to 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 make sure that they aren't the ones paying. And it's and and, and it's it, it's sad to see them well, resort to lying. Let's have an honest debate. Stop lying, it, Harry. It's so hypocritical to see them now wringing their hands over the plight of the poor and the lower income folks and everything else when they are the architects of the destruction of the lower income folks by taking that PFD, the impact. And just, again, the disingenuousness of it is uh, it's shocking. It's just quite shocking in the in the long run. Hey, Brad, how about that fiscal plan that the uh, Senate cooked up? Huh? That's a that's a doozy. <laughs> That's a great fiscal plan, right? We've got a fiscal plan. It's called 7525. What happens when you run out of, well, we'll just, we'll decide then in two years when we run out of money. Uh, uh, Ed King's got a piece on that. I'll let you, uh, I'll let you take the floor on that for a minute. Ed's got a great piece for those that don't follow uh, Ed. It's uh, kingeconomics.com. Uh, he wrote a new piece uh, uh, talking about the, uh, the, the fiscal plan from a game theory standpoint. Uh, Ed uh, uh, is an economist by training uh, and and specializes in game theory, and and sort of tries to game out where the where the fiscal plan goes. He divides the state into he divides the legislature essentially uh, into three pieces. One, uh, the Democrats who are uh, who want to maximize spending uh, and want to uh, uh, would would like to, to retain the PFD, but are willing to give the PF, PFD up in order to maximize spending. What he calls the Hickel Republicans, which are all for spending on uh, invest on uh, infrastructure and on a variety of things that uh, 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 would would you know further the 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 state's support of certain industries. Uh, and then the Hammond Republicans who are focused on the PFD and are focused on the private sector and focused on the impact of, of PFD cuts on, uh, on Alaska families. And it's a great piece that sort of games out how, how those three pieces, the Democrats, the Hickel Republicans and the, and the Hammond Republicans sort of interact with each other and, and how, how that interaction results in a fiscal plan. Basically, it's sort of the same thing that, I, that I've said earlier on. Uh, another way of saying what I've said earlier on is when it dawned on me that Natasha von Imhoff and, and the rich Republicans, the wealthy Republicans, the top 20% Republicans had become aligned with the Democrats. What I realized was going on was the alignment was spend all you want. We won't oppose your spending, but don't tax us. Don't tax the top 20%. Find another way to raise the revenue by shoving the costs off on middle and lower. Don't tax us. Don't tax our friends in the oil industry. Find another way of shoving the costs off by uh, by cutting PFDs and taking money out of the pockets of middle and taxing middle and lower income Alaska families. Ed's game theory is sort of is sort of a variation on that, or sort of a a different way of putting the same point. That right. What we what we found is that the 
the Democrats and the Hickel Republicans are are aligning on spend, spend and they'll fight about what the spending ought to be on, but the central theme is spend, but don't tax us, don't the Hickel Republicans don't tax us to make us to make to pay for it. So push the costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families by uh, by cutting the PFD. <laughs> Is is it me? And I mean, I I quoted that quote uh, a few a minute ago just because it was it, to me it was just so in your face. I felt like uh, when they said that that they were giving us the finger. But break it down for me, Barney style here, Brad. The idea that somehow that the seventy five twenty five is a fiscal plan. <laughs> um, I mean, they literally with a straight face looked at the camera and said that that oh, that's a fiscal plan. Um, and that's just, you know, that's spending. Spending is one component of this fiscal plan, but they, that's, that's what they go. And, they, and then they look you in the eye and tell you with all seriousness, that's a fiscal plan. Well, it's, it's, I mean, the, the fiscal plan, the, the, the PFD plan is whatever it needs to be in order to fund whatever they want, whatever they agree to spend on. And the fiscal plan at one point was, um, okay, we'll, we'll take the, the other share of, of, uh, of, of the permanent fund earnings stream after the, after the PFD, the Hammond plan. Then it was, and that was, that was Governor Dunleavy's plan at one time. Now it's become his plan again, but it really isn't his plan because he isn't backing it up. Uh, but that, that was sort of the first uh, line in the sand. Then it was POMB 50-50, right? Then it was, okay, we'll sort of stop at POMB 50-50. But, but I'm told there was a, there was a discussion uh, between GCI of all people and, uh, and and the chairs of the finance committee at the time, that 50-50 wasn't going to be enough. It wasn't going to provide enough revenue uh, to the government to uh, to keep spending, to keep the revenues flowing to to support the spending they wanted. Um, and so then it became POMB twenty five seventy five because that was sort of the next convenient stopping point, right? That was the next uh, 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 logical number to go to. And, and so now it's POMB 2575, but we're going to find, um, as we've talked about on the show before, we're going to find in a couple of years, it's, well, it's, re it's really 80, 20, and then it's 15, uh, 85 and it'll just keep going until it's gone. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Senator Hughes on the Senate floor said, Mr. President, cutting the PFD is not a fiscal plan. Uh, yeah, you think? I mean, that's uh, is what we're trying to point out here. It is not a fiscal plan. Give me a tease for number two, which is, of course, what should the governor be doing? And and Ben Carpenter covered a bit of this last week, and we've talked about it with a couple other legislators. But what is the governor? What should he be doing? What is he doing? And what should he be doing? I think you had a great. I think you had a great interview with Ben last week, uh, and Ben made the point that that it's really up to the governor. He's done what he can do. The Senate sort of rolled over the House, and with the with those in the House majority who joined with the minority to pass the Senate budget, he's sort of at a at a at an endpoint, sort of at a at a loggerheads. Basically, what he was saying, what I understood Ben to be saying, is the governor needs to weigh in and rebalance the scale and say, yes, the PFD is important. Yes, getting spending under control is important, uh, but the governor, it's up to the governor to weigh in. And then, as Ben said. Then we're going to. Then they may listen to other voices uh, once the governor is, has weighed in and sort of rebalanced the scale. But the way we're going right now, they don't have to rebalance the scale because between the House minority and the and and those in the majority who join the House minority to pass the Senate budget, uh, uh, there is no there is no stopping point for 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 where this goes. So I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about in the second segment about what the governor could do, picking up on some of Ben's ideas, but what the governor could do to uh, to rebalance the scale. We're on to number two, which is what should Governor Dunleavy do with the budget? As our discussions with Ben Carpenter showed last week, he is literally the last line of defense for any of us who are fans of smaller, more limited government. Uh, he's got an opportunity here, but as we have seen him waste those opportunities in the past, I don't know how positive we should be about this. But Brad, what uh, what's your take on this? What should we be looking forward to? What should we be encouraging the governor to do? Well, after I listened to Ben's uh, interview, uh, your interview with Ben, which I thought was an excellent interview, and if anybody hasn't listened to it, they ought to uh, go back and, and listen to it in, in podcast form from last week. 
after I listened to that, I thought about it a while. What Ben's basically saying is, look, we can't, our side can't get any traction. I mean, the Senate sort of run over us. There was enough defections in the House majority to join with the House minority that uh, that we got run over. And and we can't get any traction to get to a fiscal plan. And and he said, you know, that, that, that they will just keep taking the PFD more and more and more of the PFD to fund their spending um, until the PFD is gone. And there's really... As long as you've got the Senate majority push, willing to do that, willing to take whatever out of the PFD they need, and as long as you've got enough in the House minority or the House majority to agree with the House minority uh, uh, to continue to do that, there really isn't a stopping point. Ben's point was the really the last line of defense here, the, the ability to get back some leverage and to get back some balance in this process is the governor. And, and, and Ben's thought process was the governor needs to be prepared uh, to veto uh, a portion of spending uh, and essentially say, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow the PFD to be used for all this spending. The, the sort of the play out of that is uh, in my mind is the governor would say uh, uh, in his veto message, look, we're going to draw the line at POMB 50, 50. We're not going to make middle and lower income Alaska families pay for any more of this than coming down to POMB 5050. If you want to spend more, you've got to find other revenue sources to do it. Put the burden back on the legislature to find those revenue sources. And the governor's going to say, look, to get the PO the, to, to, to fund POMB 5050, you have to put $800 million back into the P back into the back into the PFD. Uh, and so I'm going to veto $800 million of spending out of the budget, creating enough money to put $800 million back in the PFD. I'll tell you what, I'm going to, this would be the governor's message. I'll tell you what, I'm going to call a special session. And if you want to put that $800 million in spending back, pass revenue measures, have the guts to pass revenue measures that either, you know, put the burden on, on the oil companies or put the burden on, on a broad-based tax that puts a portion of the burden on the top 20% as well as non-residents. I will give you the opportunity to add that revenue back in and to save that spending. But if you're not willing to pass revenue measures to more broadly base uh, the revenue uh, on, uh, to broad, more broadly base the, 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 the revenue supporting that spending, then, then I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna support the spending either. We're not gonna do it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through any deeper cuts than, uh, than, than POMB 50-50. Uh, that's, that's a message that, it, the problem with what the governor did in 2019 was, was was say, or what the governor did in 2019 was say, I'm just going to veto. Period. We're not going to spend on these matters. That caused that caused the explosion. What this, how this message would be different is, look, I'm going to veto. We're going to have POMB 50/50. That's going to be the bottom line. I'm going to veto out the money to be able to create uh, uh, POMB 50/50. But I'm not going to say you can't spend. If you find the revenues uh, uh, for that additional spending, then uh, then go ahead and do it, and uh, and and we'll uh, we'll continue to have the spending. With that veto message, the governor could follow through with what he said he was going to do last spring, but never did, which is put a sales tax on the table and say, look, if you want to um, uh, uh, fund this, if you want to have the additional spending, here I'm going to propose a sales tax. Use the sales tax. Use oil taxes. Use whatever. Use whatever measures you want to use. But we're not going to fund it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families anymore. We've done enough. We've taken enough out of their pockets uh, in in funding government. There's 800 million dollars there that legitimately could be put in spending that could legitimately could put on be put on the table. It's it, it will cause an explosion on some fronts. But there's 800. There's a logic for 800 million dollars. The increase in the operating budget, the agency budget between FY22 and FY24, leaving out the year, the, the year where we had an explosion in oil in oil revenues. <coughs> the difference between the two is $500 million. So we had $4 million, $4 million in agency spending in FY22, and we have $4.5 million now in the in the legislature's uh, budget for uh, FY24. So you can yep, veto yep. out. Billion. Five hundred million dollar there. Five hundred million dollars there, right? And then, and then the other three hundred million dollars 
is probably in the capital budget. And you would say, I'm going to take the capital budget back to uh, what's necessary to match the federal funds that are coming into the state. Look, if you want $35 million to groom trails and do the other stuff uh, that you proposed, if you want the additional money, uh, uh, the additional $300 in money to, for, the, for the other capital projects, fine. But pass a revenue measure. We're not going to do it on the backs of, of middle and lower income Alaska families. I think, I think that is a message that the governor could give that would then restore the balance. So then we come into the October session, into the special session, and Ben's committee means something. It is the, it is the committee that's going to consider how to raise that additional revenue to, to cover the additional spending that, uh, that the governor has, right. uh, has vetoed out. Well, because we've heard uh, from several sources, uh, and in fact, I think even Rob Myers mentioned it on the program, having just having a special session in October with the budget not being on the table, there is no leverage for the other side to come to the table at all, the Senate to come to the side of the table at all. You could have a special session, but they'll just gavel in and gavel out, he says. They're not they're not interested in talking about any other. So they, they think they've got a fiscal plan. But if you had something like this, there would be leverage for them to have to show up and actually do something. Is that is that are you uh, in agreement with that, uh, yeah. that take on it? Yeah. Yeah. I think I think then the burden is on is on the Senate. Uh, if the governor's clear about it, if the burden is then on the Senate and then on the House minority to come up with, and, and those in the House majority that voted with the House minority for the Senate's budget. I think the burden is then on them to come up with a with a broad based more fair, more equitable, uh, less one-sided revenue source uh, to fund that additional uh, $800 million. Oil taxes, we're going to talk about briefly in the next segment about $100 million you can get from Hillcourt. Um, it, uh, there are revenue sources there. The governor's talked about sales taxes. There are revenue sources there. And I think if we came to the October session with those vetoes on the table, but with the governor saying, look, you want the spending? Fine. Pay for it. Pay for it equitably. We're not going to pay for it anymore off the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Pay for it equitably. I think if the governor sent that message, we'd have, an, we'd have a very interesting October session because then you've got the top 20%. You've got Carl Mars and Harry McDonald and all of the others then confronted with, oh my God, well, we like the spending when we didn't have to pay for it. But right. now you're going to make us pay for a portion of it? Well, maybe we don't like that spending as much as as we thought we did. Um, and you get a session that I think really confronts whether all Alaskans, including the top 20%, are willing to pay for the additional spending that we keep now heaping on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. Okay, Brad, so give me some Vegas odds here. What do you think? I mean, because the governor's been radio silent. I mean, he's been in Germany and doing all this other kind of stuff, but I mean, there's been, it's like zero. There's nothing coming out of the governor's office on the budget or anything else, what do you think is actually, I mean, you've laid out the kind of the perfect plan if somebody in the governor's office is listening, but what do you think is actually going to happen? Well, it goes back to, you know, the discussion we had back at the time of the governor's after the, after the November election, does the governor want to establish a legacy? Does he want to be the second Hammond? Does he want to stand up and support the PFD? Does he want to draw a line in the sand and said, we're not going to, we're not going to, obliterate the pf the pfd uh does he want to set a legacy or does he just want to be you know go along and get along and you know maybe run for senate against whoever the hell he's going to run against for senate lisa or whoever uh when whenever whenever that next uh opportunity comes up if he's the go along get along governor he won't do it i mean if he's if, yeah. e even though even though there's a perfectly legitimate way of saying this is different than 2019 I'm not saying no spending. I'm just saying pay for it yourselves as opposed to continuing to shift it to middle and lower income Alaska families. If he's the go along, get along governor, he won't do it. If he's a governor who wants to leave a legacy, this is the way to do it. This is the way to draw a line in the sand and say, we're going to do uh, we're going to do this differently going forward. One of the revenue options, of course, as you just mentioned, is the oil patch. And you've talked about you and I have talked about that. There's still several hundred million dollars probably left on the table in a variety of different ways. One of which is number three, the Hill Corp. Uh, you're asking the question, why should Hill Corp get a hundred million dollar bonus, basically paid for by the PFD? We got about three minutes here. Well, this is this goes back to a discussion we had a few weeks ago. Look, SB 21 was supposed to give the the, the 2013 law 
uh, changing oil taxes. That was supposed to give all the incentive that the oil companies ever needed to develop additional supplies, right? What Hillcorp's getting is a hundred million dollar bonus on top of SB 21, simply as a result of the way they're, they're, they've structured their corporation, simply because they're an LLC as opposed to a C corporation. They're an S corporation for tax purposes as opposed to a C corporation. Simply because of that, they get a hundred million dollar bonus. Why the hell should Hillcorp be getting a hundred million dollar bonus when at the same time we're seeing headlines like we did last week in the ADN, Alaska regulators fine Hillcorp $267,000 saying oil producer has a track record of violations. Why are we giving an oil producer that has a track record of violations a hundred million dollar bonus on top of the SB 21 incentives? We shouldn't. That should be gone. That should have been gone day one after Hill Corp acquired BP, but it's drug on and drug on and drug on. And, and that should come to an end. Uh, and it could be, and it could easily be part of the revenue package that the governor or that the governor would accept or propose as part of, as part of the veto message to, to protect the POMB 50, 50. And it's that simple. I know a lot of people are bent out of shape about, well, Brad, you just want more taxes on corporations now here in the state of Alaska. That, that That's it. This is very specifically a carve out for the oil producers, right? It's a hundred, not for the oil producers, for Hillcorp. Right. It's a hundred million dollar bonus on top of SB 21. We can argue all day long about whether SB 21 needs to be revisited, but this is, this is separate and apart from that. It's a hundred million dollars bonus to Hillcorp on top of SB 21. Yeah. No producer. I mean, we said SB 21 in a way that was supposed to incentivize production. It's done it or it hasn't done it. We can argue about that. But there's no justification for, for giving a $100 million bonus on top of SB 21. And here's the argument. Um, Hill Corp doesn't have a loophole. It's not a corporation. Alaska does not and should not have an income tax. Um, and Brad must be advocating for every small business in Alaska to pay the corporate income tax. Nope. So that, I'm advocating, the, I'm advocating for oil producers to pay for, uh, to be treated equally across the board for Hill Corp to be treated the same as Conoco, to be treated the same as uh, Exxon, to be treated the same as every other producer up on the slope and have the same tax structure. I'm advocating for Hill Corp to have the same track tax structure that BP had when BP owed in exactly the same properties. There's no difference between BP and Hillcorp other than their corporate structure. And I'm advocating for the, the oil corporations. We've treated oil corporations separately for purposes of taxes. We can treat them separately for purposes of this tax for Hillcorp to be treated exactly the same as Conoco, Exxon in the way that, that BP was. And that's what I was saying when I said carve out. I wasn't meaning a carve out specifically for Hillcorp. I'm saying they have carved out the oil industry into a separate taxation structure versus other corporations in the state of Alaska. I mean, they treated them separately in the past, and this would basically be following in the same footsteps if we did that with Hillcorp and changed the uh, to the S Corp or LLC function, right? Exactly right. I mean, why why should we be giving Hillcorp? I mean, SB twenty one was hard fought. SB twenty one was this is the structure we need in order to incentivize producers to produce additional volumes uh, in the state of Alaska. Remember that we that Alaska has a constitutional obligation to maximize the revenues for the benefit for the benefit of the people. We 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 set SB 21 so that we achieved that objective took as took as many dollars as we could but created an incentive for the producers still to to continue to to develop and invest. Why does Hillcorp need a 100 million dollar bonus on top of that, you can argue that that's violating the Constitution in the sense that we're allowing Hillcorp to retain money that's that's additional to what's necessary to to develop uh, to develop those resources, and and as a result, we're not maximizing the revenue for the for the for the or we're not maximizing the benefit for the for the people. We are instead giving a hundred million dollar bonus to Hillcorp just because it happened to come into the state in a different corporate structure than the others. SB 20, SB 20, we can argue SB 21 all day long, but keep in mind, this is a bonus that Hillcorp's getting on top of SB 21. And there's no, no one has said, oh, 
it's needed to for Hillcorp to do additional exploration. They're not doing additional exploration. There's no one who said Hillcorp needs this additional bonus in order to do this. It's simply, ah, we, Hillcorp's a corporation that's formed as an LLC. It ought to be, ought to be getting that $100 million, $100 million. No, it shouldn't. That $100 million coming from the Alaska, the, the resource that's owned for the benefit of all Alaskans ought to be going to Alaskans. It ought not to be going to that corporation. And of course, you're talking about Article 3, Section 8 of the Constitution, which mandates that all resources be uh, developed to the maximum benefit is what the is what the uh, verbiage says. Uh, and many politicians have argued the maximum benefit means maximum money uh, to the state of Alaska. So this would, I guess, fall in line with that argument for many of them uh, in that regard. Uh, Brad, final thoughts here uh, before I let you go on any of the weekly top three or any of the other comments that you've seen that uh, that uh, tripped your fancy there. Well, I think I think the big burden. I think Ben hit it exactly correctly last week. I think the big burden is now coming on the governor and what the governor does. And this is this is as much as this session was an inflection point where the legislature said, "No, we're not going to stop spending. We're going to keep going, uh, and we're going to keep taking it out of the PFD." As much as this session was an inflection point in that direction, he, even though revenue, even though all revenues are are down, we're not going to stop spending. We're going to keep going. We're just going to take it out of the PFD. Even though this, it, as much as this session was that inflection point, I think this decision by the governor on whether to veto and how to veto and what to do uh, with respect to this budget is an inflection point. I think if the governor draws the line as Ben, out, ben outlined, we can get some balance back in the process and we can ensure that all Alaskans have to contribute to the cost of government. If the governor passes this, lets the budget go into effect, doesn't, uh, draw the line in the sand. Doesn't say I'm going to protect POMP 50. Um, I think I think we've hit another inflection point, and I and I think it's going to be very difficult to get Humpty Dumpty back uh, back together again uh, past this point. So I think it's I think it's a big big deal for the governor, and uh, it's going to be something that uh, we're going to be looking at closely as uh, as as the decision as he makes the decision. And of course, all of this is predicated on whether or not the governor has decided, I mean, if he's got nothing to lose and he's not doing anything else, it's one thing, but if he's decided that he wants to continue to run for higher office, it, uh, it may be, uh, he doesn't want to alienate that top 20% donor base if he's planning on running for the, uh, running for the Senate or the U S house or something like that. So, I mean, it's a real, uh, it's a conundrum and he's been radio silent up until this point. So we have no idea what he's going to be doing. Yeah. And, and it's probably not by accident that Harry's uh, Harry McDonald's uh, argument or op-ed was focused on sales taxes. The thing that the governor had raised as a potential revenue option, it's probably a shot across the bow there as well. So I, I, I think it's an, I think it's an inflection point. I think, I think this decision by the governor is going to be uh, a key indicator of uh, where the state goes from here. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you for coming on board. As always, it's good to talk with you. Appreciate you being part of it today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.